Well, it's a privilege and a delight to be speaking with you. And I would like to start with testicles. Uh, men who sleep five hours a night have significantly smaller testicles than those who sleep seven hours or more. In addition, men who routinely sleep just four to five hours a night will have a level of testosterone which is that of someone 10 years their senior. So a lack of sleep will age a man by a decade in terms of that critical aspect of wellness and virility. And I should note that we see equivalent impairments in female reproductive health caused by a lack of sleep. This is the best news that I have for you today. <laughs> From this point forward, it's only going to get worse. Rather than tell you about the wonderfully good things that happen when you get sleep, I'm going to tell you about the alarmingly bad things that happen when you don't get enough, both for your brain and for your body. Let me start with the brain and the functions of learning and memory. Because what we've discovered over the past 10 or so years is that you need sleep after learning to essentially hit the save button on those new memories so that you don't forget. So sleep will actually future-proof that information within your brain. But recently we discovered that you also need sleep before learning. But now to actually prepare your brain um, almost like a dry sponge, ready to initially soak up new memories. And without sleep, the memory circuits of the brain essentially become waterlogged, as it were, and you can't absorb new information. So let me show you the data. So here in this study, we decided to test the hypothesis that pulling the all-nighter was a good idea. So we took a group of healthy adults and assigned them to one of two experimental groups, a sleep group and a sleep deprivation group. Now, the sleep group, they're going to get a full eight hours of slumber. But the deprivation group, we're going to keep them awake in the laboratory under full supervision. Um, there's no naps. There's no caffeine. By the way, it's miserable for everyone involved. And then the next day, we're going to place those participants inside an MRI scanner. And we're going to have them try and learn a whole list of new facts as we're taking snapshots of brain activity. And then we're going to test them to see how effective that learning has been. And that's what you're looking at here on the vertical axis. And when you put those two groups head to head, what you find is a quite significant 40% deficit in the ability of the brain to make new memories without sleep. And I think this should be frightening considering what we know is happening to sleep in our education populations right now. To put that in context, it's the difference between a child acing an exam and failing it miserably, 40%. And we've gone on to discover what actually goes wrong within your brain to produce these types of learning disabilities. And there's a structure that sits on the left and the right side of your brain called the hippocampus. And you can see it here in these sort of orange-yellow colors. Think of the hippocampus like the informational inbox of your brain. It's very good at receiving new memory files and holding on to them. And when we looked at this structure in those people who'd had a full night of sleep, we saw lots of healthy learning-related activity. Yet in those people who were sleep-deprived, we actually couldn't find any significant signal whatsoever. So it's almost as though sleep deprivation um, had shut down your memory inbox, and any new incoming files, they were just being bounced you couldn't effectively commit new experiences to memory. And parenthetically, if you'd like to know what life is like without a functioning hippocampus, um, just watch the movie Memento. I suspect some of you have seen this movie. It's a great film, and I won't spoil a punchline. But this gentleman suffers brain damage. And from that point forward, he can no longer make any new memories. He's what we call densely amnesic. The part of his brain that was damaged was the hippocampus. And it is the very same structure that sleep deprivation will attack and block your brain's capacity for new learning. So that's the bad that will happen if I take sleep away from you. But let me just come back to that control group for a second. Do you remember those folks that got a full eight hours of sleep? 
Well, we can ask a very different question. What is it about the physiological quality of your sleep when you do get it that restores and enhances your memory and learning ability each and every day? And by placing electrodes all over the head, what we've discovered is that there are big, powerful brain waves that happen during the very deepest stages of sleep that have riding on top of them these spectacular bursts of electrical activity that we call sleep spindles. And it's the combined quality of these deep sleep brain waves that acts like a file transfer mechanism at night, shifting memories from a short-term vulnerable storage reservoir to a more permanent long-term storage site within the brain and therefore protecting those memories and making them safe. And it's important that we understand what it is mechanistically during sleep that transacts these memory benefits because there are real medical and societal implications. And let me just tell you about one area that we've moved this work out into clinically, which is the context of aging and dementia. Because, of course, it's no secret that as we get older, our learning and memory abilities begin to fade and decline. But what we've also recently found is that a physiological signature of aging is that your sleep gets worse especially that deep quality of sleep that I was just discussing. And only last year we finally published evidence that these two things, they're not simply co-occurring. They are significantly interrelated. And it suggests that the disruption of deep sleep is an underappreciated factor that is contributing to what we call cognitive decline or memory decline in aging, and most recently we've discovered in Alzheimer's disease as well. Now, I know this is remarkably depressing news. Um, it's coming at you, it's in the mail, um, if it's not there already. But there's a possible silver lining here. Unlike many of the other factors that we know are associated with aging, and for example, changes in the physical structure of the brain, that's fiendishly difficult to treat. And medicine has no good approaches right now. But that sleep is a missing piece in the explanatory puzzle of aging and Alzheimer's is exciting because we may be able to do something about it. And one way that we have been approaching this at my sleep center um, is not by using sleeping pills, by the way. They are blunt instruments that do not produce naturalistic sleep, and they've been associated with a significantly higher risk of death as well as cancer. And I'm happy to speak about that during the Q&A. Instead, what we've developed is a method uh, based on this. It's called um, direct current brain stimulation. You insert a small amount of voltage into the brain. So small you typically don't feel it, but it has a measurable impact. Now, if you apply this stimulation during sleep in young, healthy adults, as if you're sort of um, singing in time with those deep sleep brain waves, not only can we amplify the size of those deep sleep brain waves, but in doing so, we can almost double the amount of memory benefit that you get from sleep. The question now is whether we can translate this same affordable, potentially portable piece of technology into older adults and those with dementia. Can we restore back some healthy quality of deep sleep? And in doing so, can we salvage aspects of their learning and memory function? That is my real hope now. That's one of our moonshot goals, as it were. And that goal is much closer to becoming a reality because we've founded a new company called STEM Science and it has all of the support um, and the um, fantastic armament of KV. Uh, we have our seed funding from them. We've been uh, now up and running for about four months. We are hoping to become the first, essentially, an electroceutical company by way of brain stimulation. We're targeting sleep to begin with, but we're not going to stop there because the brain controls all physiological systems of the body, immune systems, cardiovascular systems, metabolic systems, even reproductive systems. But we'll start with sleep. So that's sleep at this stage for your brain, but sleep is just as essential for your body. And we've already spoken a little bit about sleep loss and your reproductive system. Or I could tell you about sleep loss and your cardiovascular system, and that all it takes is one hour 
because there is a global experiment performed on 1.6 billion people across 70 countries twice a year. And it's called daylight savings time. Now, in the spring, when we lose one hour of sleep, we see a subsequent 24% increase in heart attacks the following day. In the autumn, in the fall, when we gain an hour of sleep, we see a 21% reduction in heart attacks. Isn't that incredible? And you see exactly the same profile for car crashes, road traffic accidents, even suicide rates. But as a deeper dive, I want to focus on this, sleep loss and your immune system. And here I'll introduce these delightful blue elements in the image. They are called natural killer cells. Think of natural killer cells like the secret service agents of your immune system. They are very good at identifying dangerous, unwanted elements and eliminating them. In fact, what they're doing here is um, embedding themselves into um, a malignant cancerous tumor mass, and then they will destroy it. So what you wish for is a virile set of these immune assassins at all times. And tragically, that's what you don't have if you're not sleeping enough. So here in this next study, we're not going to deprive you of sleep for an entire night. You're simply going to have your sleep restricted to four hours for one single night, and then we're going to look to see what's the percent reduction in immune cell activity that you suffer. And it's not small, it's not 10%, it's not 30%. There was a 70% drop in natural killer cell activity. That's an alarming state of immune deficiency. And you can perhaps well understand now why we're finding significant links between short sleep duration and your risk for the development of numerous forms of cancer. Currently, that list includes cancer of the bowel, cancer of the prostate, and cancer of the breast. In fact, the link between a lack of sleep and cancer is now so strong that recently the World Health Organization decided to classify any form of nighttime shift work as a probable carcinogen. Jobs that can induce cancer because of a disruption of your sleep-wake rhythms. So you may have heard of that old maxim that you can sleep when you're dead. Well, I'm being quite serious now. It is mortally unwise advice. We know this from epidemiological studies across millions of individuals. There's a simple truth. The shorter your sleep, the shorter your life. Short sleep predicts all-cause mortality. And if increasing your risk for the development of cancer or even Alzheimer's disease were not um, sufficiently disquieting, we have since discovered, finally, that a lack of sleep will even erode the very fabric of biological life itself, your DNA genetic code. So here in this study, we took a group of healthy adults and we limited them to six hours of sleep a night for one week and then measured the change in their gene activity profile relative to when those same individuals were getting a full eight hours of sleep a night. And there were two key findings. First, a sizable and significant 711 genes were distorted in their activity caused by that lack of sleep. And by the way, this is ecologically relevant. We know that one out of every two adults in developed nations is trying to survive on six hours of sleep a night during the week. The second result was that about half of those genes were actually increased in their activity. The other half were actually decreased. Now, those genes that were actually switched off by a lack of sleep were genes associated with your immune system. So once again, you can see that immune deficiency. In contrast, those genes that were upregulated or overexpressed because of a lack of sleep were genes that were associated with the promotion of tumors, genes associated with long-term chronic inflammation within your body, and genes that were associated with stress and, as a consequence, cardiovascular disease. There is simply no aspect of your wellness that can retreat at the sign of sleep deprivation and get away unscathed. 
It's almost like a broken water pipe in your home. Sleep loss will leak down into every nook and cranny of your physiology. Even tampering with the very DNA nucleic alphabet that spells out your daily health narrative. And at this point, you may be thinking, okay, oh my goodness, how do I get better sleep? What are your tips for better sleep? Well, beyond avoiding the damaging and harmful impact of alcohol and caffeine on sleep, and if you're struggling with sleep at night, avoiding naps during the day, I have two additional pieces of advice. The first is regularity. Go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time, no matter whether it's the weekday or the weekend. Regularity is king, and it will anchor your sleep and therefore improve the quantity and the quality of that sleep. The second is keep it cool. Your body needs to drop its core temperature by about two to three degrees Fahrenheit to initiate sleep and then to stay asleep. And it's the reason you will always find it easier to fall asleep in a room that's too cold than too hot. So aim for a bedroom temperature of around about 67 degrees. I know it sounds cold, but it's optimal for the sleep of most people. So finally then, in taking a step back, what is the mission critical statement here? Well, I think it could be this. Sleep, unfortunately, is not an optional lifestyle luxury. Sleep is a non-negotiable biological necessity. It is your life support system, and it is Mother Nature's best effort yet at immortality. And the decimation of sleep throughout industrialized nations is having a catastrophic impact on our health, our wellness, even the safety and the education of our children. It is a silent sleep loss epidemic, and it is fast becoming one of the greatest public health challenges that we face in the 21st century. I believe it is now time for us to reclaim our right to a full night of sleep. Um, and without embarrassment or that unfortunate stigma of laziness, and in doing so, we can be reunited with the most powerful elixir of life, the Swiss army knife of health, as it were. And with that soapbox rant over, I will simply say good night, good luck, and above all, I do hope you sleep well. Thank you very much indeed. I'm a cardiologist, and this 24% increase in heart attacks with, uh, and the 21%, is there a reference for that? Because I've yeah. never heard of that. Yeah, I will send you. Let's connect, and I, I can send you the details. I, in fact, I, I actually do have it in my slide deck, but I don't have the uh, computer here to show you the reference. But I'll send it to you. Yeah, it's a great paper. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, John Hamm in the back. Um, you mentioned eight hours as a night's sleep. Is, is, is eight hours the gold standard? Are there some people naturally less, naturally more? But I mean, sh should we all be shooting for eight hours? And what if you just naturally don't sleep that long and you wake up? Yeah, so it's a great question. So right now, the recommendation is seven to nine hours is the optimal for most human beings based on all of the studies that we look at. Um, I would also say that the number of people who can survive on six hours of sleep uh, or less without showing any impairment rounded to a whole number and expressed as a percent of the population is zero. <laughs> Wait a second, Matt. Our president sleeps only four hours a night. What I would say is, uh, first, firstly, proof of concept. Um, secondly, I would say that there have been lots of people who've been vocal about how little they sleep. In fact, heads of state, Margaret Thatcher was a good example. Ronald Reagan was a good example. They were chess beaters about how little sleep that they, um, they got. Now, whether it's true that they were surviving on five hours of sleep or four hours of sleep, we will never know. I don't think, however, it's coincidental that tragically both of them went on to develop Alzheimer's disease. And we now know that insufficient sleep is probably the most significant lifestyle factor 
determining whether or not you will develop Alzheimer's disease. And I don't say that flippantly. There is causal evidence, not just associational evidence. Okay, maybe, one, maybe two more. Uh, Alex? A lot of us schedule meetings for people. Are we giving them cancer if we bring them in too early? Yeah, so your chronotype is simply, are you a morning type or are you an evening type? You don't get to decide. It's genetically hardwired from birth. We know the genes. We also know that if you sleep out of sync with your chronotype, there are deleterious health consequences, marked risks in stroke, uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, as well as obesity so far. There's a new study coming out that will also find that link with cancer as well. So I think the more that we can be sensitive to people's chronotype, the healthier and the better they will be. By the way, if you're trying to get an evening type to work in the morning, you're wasting a lot of your financial resources. You'd be much better off letting them work when their biological system wants to be awake and wants to be efficient in terms of working. Great. Uh, last question, Steve. Yeah, what do you think about the uh, blue light hazards caused by computers and iPads and uh, how it relates to cell phones? So the impact of blue light, we now know. Um, there was a study done that's discussed in uh, the book where people read an iPad for one hour before bed versus just a normal paper book in dim light. Firstly, when they read on the iPad, it delayed the release of a sleep timing hormone called melatonin, and it delayed that release by three hours. So if you do one hour of iPad reading before bed, you're much closer to Hawaii time if you're living in California than you are California time. Secondly, it blunted the amount of melatonin that was released. It reduced it by 50%. It also decreased the amount of rapid eye movement sleep that they had. And when they stopped reading the device, their sleep was still disrupted for two to three nights afterwards. In other words, there was a blast radius that happened after that iPad. So we do know of the effects. Um, we really should wrap up. Maybe, maybe you guys can catch Matt. I will be around in the break, and I'll do a sleep salon <laughs> intervention, uh, whatever is required. So just a couple of thank announcements. You. So after this, well, let's thank Matt first oh. of all. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.